The Antelope was a slaver, a slave ship built to carry enslaved captives uh, that had already made at least two journeys to Africa and brought several hundred enslaved people back to the island of Cuba. In 1819, a very wealthy Spanish Cuban merchant, Santiago de la Cuesta de Manzanal, uh, had hired the Antelope and outfitted it for another voyage to Africa in which he hoped to bring 300 new slaves, Negros Bozales, uh, back to uh, Cuba. Uh, so it departed Havana and sailed to the coast of West Africa. And there in March of 1820, it was collecting captives uh, at a, a place called Cabinda. Cabinda is an enclave that belongs to Angola nowadays. It's on the central coast of West Africa, just north of the mouth of the Congo River. It is a, it's a difficult thing if you think of Africans as all one particular cultural or ethnic group. And of course, that's not the case at all. Uh, Africans are just as divided as Europeans and they have various ethnic groups, language groups, nationalities that they identify with. So Africans at Cabinda were selling people who were from other ethnic groups, language groups, or cultures. Probably the captives in the Antelope case are, are mostly Congo. Uh, from the interior and south of the Congo River who had been brought by merchants to Cabinda and then there sold to Europeans. What happens is uh, a, a privateer uh, or uh, a, a, I guess you could say an individually commissioned uh, ship that raids commerce of enemies, uh, a privateer called the Araganta, which is under the flag of the Banda Oriental. Uh, the Banda Oriental is a predecessor to modern-day Uruguay. Uh, they are in rebellion against Spain. They're also at war with Portugal. They're at war with Portuguese Brazil. Uh, and having um, the Banda Oriental is very advantageous for a privateer because they can raid ships from all those nations. Uh, the ship itself was actually from Baltimore and was probably crewed uh, mostly by Americans. Uh, and the ship captured the antelope and the uh, captives who were on board the antelope. Uh, they took the antelope's original crew and marooned them on the shore uh, there in Africa. Uh, and uh, then they set sail uh, west across the Atlantic Ocean uh, in company, the two ships headed for Brazil. It's a treacherous area. It's uh, uh, reefs and small islands, uh, and uh, the Araganta, the privateering vessel, is wrecked. And so the prize captain, who had been the first mate on the Araganta, uh, perhaps appropriately named John Smith, uh, the, 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 the captain who's commanding the Antelope decides that he should continue the voyage and try to find uh, a place to sell the captives. So they turn northward and they go to the Dutch colony of Suriname uh, and they come very close to selling the captives there, but it's illegal uh, under Dutch law to import slaves. And having been outed, uh, they flee Suriname and they continue further north into the Caribbean uh, and they end up at St. Bart's uh, which was a Swedish colony and very much a notorious pirate hangout in the Caribbean. Uh, and there a mysterious Mr. Mason, who may have actually been involved with the actual investors behind the Antelope, uh, arranged uh, for a special meeting to occur in the Bahamas uh, between a vessel that he would charter and the Antelope. So the vessel continued up uh, and off, uh, well, in what's called the Northwest Passage of the Bahamas, uh, off the, the north of, of Nassau. Uh, they rendezvoused, and there some cannons and other uh, implements of war were put aboard the Antelope, and then the Antelope set out for St. Augustine. It's armed. Uh, they are uh, carrying out the pretense, probably, of being a privateer themselves at this point instead of being a, a vessel that's been captured uh, by privateers. Uh, and they had hoped, uh, if Spanish Florida was in its last days, uh, 
uh, and uh, the thing there had been a great deal of, of uh, strife in Florida in the previous decade. Uh, there had been substantial slave trading that had gone on at Amelia Island, uh, where Fernandina Beach, Florida is today. So uh, I think that John Smith hoped to be able to sell his captives there, uh, but he made a terrible error. Uh, they kidnapped the son of the governor of Spanish Florida, a young man named Coppinger. And when they arrived at St. Augustine, uh, John Smith tried to use holding this captive hostage uh, as a way to force the governor to allow them to land the captives from the antelope. It didn't work. The governor said he would not negotiate with pirates and kidnappers, that they could hang his son if they wanted to. Uh, Smith was uh, not so willing to be violent <laughs> to a young white man, although he was very violent toward the captives. Uh, so he released the son and then they turned north. They're low on water, they're low on food. Uh, most of the food that they're feeding the captives is rice, so you need water to make the rice and seawater is not gonna help in that situation. Uh, they're getting into a desperate state. Uh, and then it is at that point when they've turned north uh, that the Revenue Service Cutter uh, spots them and chases them down. Probably there were 331 captives who left Africa. Uh, when they were captured uh, by the Revenue Cutter, there were either 280 or 281 still alive. By the time the ship actually arrived here in Savannah, uh, there were 258 surviving captives. So that's uh, about a 22% death rate among these captives. Uh, those who have survived are sick. Uh, many can't walk. Uh, the United States Marshal here is supposed to take control of the captives, and he had arranged for them to stay at the local horse racing track, which was about a two-mile walk from the wharf where they came in. Uh, and uh, the captives were not capable of walking. So he had to hire wagons, and the captives came off of the antelope, uh, and he recorded uh, them and put them in general age categories. And it turned out that the average age is less than 14, that 42% of the captives are 10 or younger. Uh, there's even infants uh, among the captives. Uh, it's about two-thirds male and one-third female. Uh, and most of the males, I mean, there are males in their teens and early 20s, but these are young boys for the most part and young girls for the most part. So they're imprisoned in the st uh, stables, the, the horse stalls at the racetrack. And um, it, it is a hot summer, it is a rainy summer. Uh, throughout the month of July and into August, it rains almost every day, and a yellow fever epidemic begins in Savannah. Uh, whether from yellow fever or from the effects of their voyage, uh, the captives continue to die in very large numbers. The captives uh, were then taken to uh, the Savannah horse racing track where they were imprisoned in the stables that would have normally been used for horses there. Um, and it was a hot summer, it was a rainy summer. Uh, July and August it rained virtually every day heavily. Uh, the captives were mostly children, uh, they were naked, uh, they had been shaven of all their hair. Uh, they had finally blankets given to them, but I just have this image of these naked children wrapped in blankets walking around this muddy uh, uh, field that was the racetrack. Uh, and then uh, Savannah itself uh, began suffering a yellow fever epidemic. Whether from yellow fever or from problems brought with them uh, aboard the ship, uh, the captives continued dying. Uh, so that another 20% or so of these captives uh, died during the month that they were at the, the racetrack. Uh, the U.S. Marshal, a guy named John H. Morrell, uh, was in charge uh, uh, of these captives, and he decided that they had to be moved, and his solution was to distribute them to wealthy families here in town and to uh, give uh, 51 of the healthiest males to the city uh, to work on public projects.
they're doing the work of slaves and horrifically doing it in the midst of a growing yellow fever epidemic. There's been no judicial determination as to their status. Uh, and uh, as we will find out later, um, uh, they should be under U.S. law free, according to the U.S. attorney here in Savannah. The Spanish uh, Cuesta Manzanal uh, and company, uh, or, and brother, uh, the Spanish firm that had paid for the Antelope's voyage, uh, the, very quickly finds out about the ship arriving with the captives on board and that it is their ship. And so they send representatives and through their vice consul here in Savannah, uh, they file a claim in admiralty to have the captives returned to them as their property. Uh, because uh, a number of the captives were said to have been taken from Portuguese vessels, the Portuguese vice consul also filed a claim uh, for the captives. Then uh, the uh, commander of the revenue cutter, uh, Captain Jackson, uh, he also filed a claim either for bounty, which would be uh, $25 per person if they were freed, or for salvage, which would be a percentage award of the value that the court ascribes to these people if they're enslaved. And then John Smith, the privateer captain, once he is cleared of charges of privacy, he also enters a claim saying that all the captives are his property. So these parties assemble in Savannah's old brick courthouse, uh, and there they are contending as to who will get what share of these captives. And Savannah's done this before. They'd had several vessels brought in, uh, and uh, the captives would be divvied up and sold off, and everybody would make some money, and it was uh, a, you know, a normal thing in Savannah. To everyone's shock, uh, very highly regarded Savannian, uh, Richard Wiley Habersham, who is the United States Attorney for uh, the District of Georgia, enters the case and he claims that all the captives should be given to the United States government for return to Africa and freedom. That they are not slaves, that they are instead free people who under the slave trade law of 1819 should be returned to Africa. The law came out of the creation of the American Colonization Society in many ways. Uh, the American Colonization Society, which wanted to create a colony in Africa for uh, freed slaves and for uh, um, uh, free blacks who lived in the United States uh, to move and live and have their own society outside of the United States. Uh, and it involved many of the leading uh, men of the time, uh, including John Marshall. Uh, the um, Colonization Society uh, had convinced both the Congress and the President to pass this law that uh, now when slave ships carrying illegal cargoes were captured, those enslaved people, or for formerly enslaved people, or potentially enslaved people, would be turned over to the federal government and they would be then returned to Africa. And the Congress appropriated $100,000 to pay for this. So Judge uh, William Davies, who is the federal uh, district judge here in Savannah, uh, completely rejects Habersham's argument that these people are free. Uh, completely rejects Habersham's argument that this is essentially uh, a habeas corpus case and these people are being held illegally, uh, uh, throws all that out and instead decides that the cargo, the human beings, must be divided among the Spanish and Portuguese claimants. Um, there are, however, stories of an American slaving vessel that had, had been captured by the Araganta, the, the privateer, from which 25 uh, slaves had been taken. So Davies rules that uh, those 25 should go to the federal government because an American vessel should not be engaged in the slave trade and that they can be returned to Africa. However, that number should be reduced due to mortality among these people. By the time they're making this decision in February of 1821, uh, there are only 212 of the captives left alive. 
So he ultimately concludes uh, that seven of the captives would be freed and that the remainder, more than 200, uh, would be given as slaves uh, to the Spanish and Portuguese claimants. Both Spain and Portugal uh, have engaged in the slave trade uh, uh, all the way up through the 18, up to 1820, 1821. Um, Spain had recently made a treaty uh, with Great Britain uh, that had said they would no longer participate in the African slave trade uh, after a certain date, but in actual fact, uh, slave trade to Cuba continued all the way up until the 1860s. Uh, Portugal, too, had entered into a treaty with Great Britain to limit their slave trade. Uh, that came uh, a little later, and they, too, continued to uh, uh, bring slaves uh, from Africa up to the 1860s. So while there is some treaty law against the slave trade, the slave trade continues. At the time the antelope was sent to Africa, a slave trading voyage for Spaniards given the correct royal uh, uh, permission was still legal. Habersham is, of course, uh, upset about uh, the majority, uh, overwhelming majority of the captives uh, being given to the Spanish and Portuguese claimants. And so when the actual numbered give it, uh, you know, divvying up uh, is ongoing, uh, he comes to that court meeting and argues again that they are all free and makes a motion to the court that they should be freed. Uh, the court rejects the motion and then he immediately says, I'm appealing this uh, to the Federal Circuit Court. Um, the Federal Circuit Court was where you uh, uh, had a Supreme Court justice riding circuit and the district court judge from that area, federal district court judge, sitting together to hear appeals. The circuit court would look at, uh, has the law been applied correctly? Uh, they, they cannot uh, take new evidence per se. Instead, they're looking uh, procedurally if things have been done correctly. Uh, and they're looking, uh, and they're, how would I put it, this is early. Uh, they're still sometimes asking questions about uh, how do we direct this toward uh, a correct, quote unquote, solution. So the circuit court looks at the decision uh, of the district court and makes certain that it follows the law, uh, makes certain that procedures uh, that need to be followed were followed. And uh, the circuit court has the power to change the holding of the district court, uh, to throw out the holding of the district court, or to send matters back to the district court to be decided further. Um, when it is finally heard in the circuit court, uh, normally both the district court judge and the Supreme Court justice for that circuit uh, would hear the case. But the, uh, the district court judge had resigned and a new one had not yet been appointed. So William Johnson, Supreme Court justice uh, from Charleston, South Carolina, uh, is deciding the case alone. Johnson uh, decides uh, that there were some errors made below. Uh, first and foremost, uh, most importantly, uh, that the ratio of who got uh, how many of the captives was wrong. Uh, so he said that there's clear evidence that the Spanish investors had put money in this and they can show that they are involved here. So he increased their share of the captives dramatically. And then he said, we will wait until the next term, at which time the Portuguese will have the chance to present their evidence of ownership. Uh, and meanwhile, the Portuguese share is gonna remain up in the air. Then he said, Davies had given too few uh, of the captives to the United States for freedom in Africa. Instead of seven, based on the rate of loss, the 25 should have been reduced uh, to 16. So he awards 16 uh, to the United States. Um, he castigates uh, Richard W. Habersham for his arguments about uh, natural rights. Uh, he uh, um, uh, ridicules him for his arguments about international law. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's not a William Johnson that you're used to seeing. Uh, he's, he's pretty 
uh, vicious in his treatment of the United States attorney uh, in this case. The Portuguese vice consul shows up with his attorneys and they present no evidence whatsoever of ownership of any of the captives. And nonetheless, William Johnson awards them a substantial share of the captives as well. And he also rules that who goes to the United States for freedom, who goes to the Portuguese, and who goes to the Spanish will all be decided by a lottery that the hand of God will, it's literally what he writes, the hand of God will guide the correct decision in who should be freed, the 16 lucky uh, captives, as I call them. At that point, Habersham literally leaps up and he is outraged and he announces that he's going to appeal this to the United States Supreme Court. Now, throughout this entire process, uh, he is officially under uh, the, uh, the, the control of the, of the Secretary of State, who is John Quincy Adams. And he has written Adams repeatedly, reporting on the case. And Adams has never given him any guidance. And so he writes Adams to tell him about uh, the uh, appeal to the Supreme Court. And in essence, uh, subtly criticizes Adams for giving him no guidance in this. And then he copies the letter along with copies of his arguments and other arguments in this case uh, to William Wirt, the Attorney General of the United States, suggesting to me that he didn't even trust Adams to communicate this information to the Attorney General. It's hard to know what's on John uh, Quincy Adams' mind. Uh, many people considered him, uh, he's an extraordinary person. He's spent most of his career as a diplomat. Uh, he's fluent in three languages. He's competent in several languages more. There's probably no one in the United States who is as familiar with foreign affairs as John Quincy Adams. But John Quincy Adams wants desperately to be president. And having just gone through the Missouri controversy and seeing that the United States could come apart on this issue of slavery, uh, I think John Quincy Adams is doing his best to prevent this case from coming into the public eye. The Antelope case raises questions of natural law and natural rights versus questions of enslaving people and property. And he does not want that uh, dispute poisoning what he hopes will be a successful presidential campaign in 1824. I'm convinced that Francis Scott Key, who was one of the leading appellate attorneys uh, in Washington, D.C. at that time, and a member of the American Colonization Society, uh, prevented this case from being buried in the Supreme Court's document, a do docket, and never being heard. Uh, so, uh, uh, Key uh, is now recruited by William Wirt to argue the United States case that these captives are free and should be returned to Africa. Uh, a newly elected United States Senator and former uh, judge here in Savannah who has been involved in this case from the beginning, John McPherson Berrien, uh, is going to represent the Spanish claimants and Jared Ingersoll, a very famous attorney uh, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, is going to represent uh, the, the Portuguese claimants. Uh, so the case finally comes before the court uh, in the winter of 1825. Key speaks first. They actually have five days of argument before the court. Uh, in those days, the justices sat in front of windows in a room that's on the very bottom floor of the Capitol. It's winter time. Those are north-facing windows. Uh, the lighting is terrible. Uh, John Marshall is in the center, and uh, for this case, there are five other justices sitting with him, a sixth justice. Uh, Justice Todd is ill and will soon die. Um, so uh, uh, the first day is Francis Scott Key's argument. And Francis Scott Key uh, goes through some of the facts of the case, knowing well that Marshall and the others are, are quite aware uh, of the, the facts as have come forward in the documents. And then he tells them that by the law of nature, all men are free and that this case has to put liberty first. And that with liberty first, unless the Spanish and Portuguese claimants can show that these individuals are 
legitimately enslaved, then we cannot consider them slaves. Then he goes further and he says under the 1819 uh, Slave Trade Act that if John Smith clearly was trying to bring these enslaved or potentially enslaved people into the United States to sell, they then too should become free and be returned to Africa. Uh, and uh, he makes an analogy of if a shipload of white men had been shipwrecked on the coast of America, we would not assume them to be slaves, even if they belonged to the day of Algiers, and in fact may have been slaves, versus why do we consider a shipload of Africans enslaved when they too are in essence washed up on the shores of America. It's a very powerful, very moving people who saw the argument, and this was very much the talk in Washington. Uh, a great deal of entertainment during the winter times in Washington was to go uh, hear cases at the Supreme Court. Uh, the room was full of people. Uh, this was on Saturday when Key made his argument. They had a full weekend uh, to consider his arguments. So on Monday, uh, John McPherson Berrien, who had developed a reputation when he was as pr at Princeton as a devastating debater, uh, he got up and uh, he took Key's argument apart, uh, literally working from a numbered list. He went item by item through answering each part uh, of Key's argument. And then when he reached the, by the law of nature, all men are free, argument. Uh, he in, pointed out to the court, uh, four of these six justices, including Marshall, the slave owners, that Key is then suggesting there can be no property in a human being. And he left it at that. Very powerful. Uh, Ingersoll made a very powerful argument about uh, international law, and William Wirt, who was probably the most experienced uh, um, appellate attorney in the room, uh, in essence recast uh, the arguments that Key had made but putting it much more closely under the 1819 statute and then it was in Marshall's hands. One of the most powerful things John Marshall did was he had such influence over the court uh, that the court was producing opinions of the court. Uh, previously, justices had written, each had written their own opinion in each case. Uh, Marshall ended this. So what this meant was the justices had to negotiate between themselves before the decision was written uh, how they would go on this case. Uh, and Marshall uh, uh, very much controls and leads this. Uh, a very, very powerful personality there. And there are other powerful personalities on the court. Um, Marshall uh, also uh, uh, comes up with an opinion that's very clever. Uh, on the one hand, uh, in his opinion, uh, he uh, says, isn't it wonderful that public sentiment can run ahead of the law? And isn't it wonderful that we understand in public sentiment uh, that it is not right to take the fruits of a man's labor from him. But the law does allow that. The law allows the slave trade at that time for the Spanish. So it is not illegal for them to have uh, slaves in the international slave trade. The law allows the slave trade for the Portuguese. So it is not illegal for them to have slaves at that time. Even though Great Britain, the United States, France, Holland, uh, etc., had all outlawed the slave trade. Uh, this then uh, uh, means that under the laws of those other nations, uh, these captives are slaves and should be returned to the other nations. In fact, he actually makes a comment that it's for their courts to decide then if they are, are, are truly slaves, but it's not our job here. But then he does a typical Marshall twist. Marshall is often very clever in his opinions, and Marshall will often make a large statement of a big idea, and the big idea here is, yes, uh, slavery is allowed under our laws, and yes, the slave trade was allowed under their laws. Uh, but then he steps back and he says, but in the past five years, there's been no evidence whatsoever presented of any Portuguese investment here. 
And he goes further and he suggests that this means that those who actually own these captives must not dare reveal themselves. And therefore, they must be, he goes on to suggest, part of a criminal conspiracy. And therefore, he is unwilling to award the Portuguese captives to anyone other than the United States for them to then return these people to Africa and to freedom. He uh, changes what had been done in the circuit court. Uh, he reduces, he takes some of the testimony that had come from John Smith, the captain of, of the Antelope when it was captured, uh, who had said there were 93 uh, people aboard. Uh, and then taking that number, he reduces it by the losses to this time. Uh, about 180 captives were still alive at this time. It's, it's a stunning thing that uh, we're down to 180 living captives when you began with 331 on the coast of Africa. And it's going to get worse. Uh, so uh, uh, Marshall reduces the award proportionally uh, to the Spanish. Uh, and uh, that means that ultimately uh, the Spanish are going to be given 39 captives. Uh, the uh, rest of the captives which would presumably have been uh, Portuguese claimants, captives, instead now go to the United States and they are to be returned to Africa and uh, then to freedom. Uh, he evidently has not thought through that where they're to be returned to in Africa is Liberia, uh, which is some 1,500 or more nautical miles from Cabinda and much further from the area these people had probably been captured. So they're going nowhere near home, but they are being returned to Africa and to freedom. The money involved in this case is overwhelming. Uh, it's millions and millions and millions of dollars. And people don't give up easily when there are such numbers involved. Uh, so actually, the antelope comes back to the Supreme Court two more times. In 1826, uh, for a division on how to decide uh, uh, who should be enslaved under the Spanish claim. And then in 1827, with Habersham once again insisting that all of these people are free, and even those who are being given to the Spanish, that, that is a mistake, and that it should, uh, they should be freed along with all the other captives. Well, interestingly, in between, uh, John Marshall had written the Secretary of the Navy, and the, and the Navy was supposed to transport the captives back. And he said, what's going on? Uh, I've heard that these captives have not been sent back. And this is before he's seen another case come before uh, the court from uh, the Antelope struggle. Um, so Marshall genuinely wanted these captives uh, to go to Liberia, and I suspect in many ways that reflects his commitment to uh, the colonization society and to obtaining more settlers for this very much struggling colony uh, on the coast of Africa. Uh, finally, in 1827, uh, after the third Supreme Court decision involving the antelope, uh, they're basically told, you do it now. Uh, and so the Navy has provided a vessel, uh, the Norfolk, uh, the, uh, in Savannah, the marshal is told to uh, load the captives on board. Uh, the captives that he has in Savannah who have been given freedom uh, of the original captives probably number about 120 or 121. Uh, but they have by this time begun to have children, uh, etc. So the marshal actually uh, uh, loads probably 130 uh, onto the ship uh, and then bills the federal government for loading 134. The ship makes it to Liberia. Uh, these people are first bound out as uh, 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 servants uh, to uh, a number of the already uh, existing settlers in the growing, very small, but growing town of Monrovia. Uh, and then a year later, they are moved to a settlement uh, just outside of the town uh, that uh, various names were proposed for, but ultimately the settlement came to be known as New Georgia. New Georgia is actually a suburb of Monrovia today, uh, but it still is called New Georgia.
and uh, there may well be descendants of these captives living there. However, it's not necessarily a happy story once they arrive. Uh, just because people are from Africa does not mean that they are uh, uh, immune to the diseases in various localities. And uh, disease is a substantial problem in this new colony of Liberia. Uh, so these people who are mostly probably of Congo extraction uh, are suddenly put on the coast of West Africa hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles away from their homes. And they are just as uh, subject to the local varieties of malaria, et cetera, as anyone else would be. Uh, so the uh, people, the 120 or so who make it to Liberia, they continue to die in large numbers. So much so that when an accounting was done in 1843, only 30 remained alive. And given the youth uh, of these captives, uh, that to me is really astonishing. 331 leaving Africa uh, in 1820, and 23 years later, only 30 are still alive. Human beings are complex and difficult. Um, no, I, I think that Marshall is sincerely a colonizationist. Uh, I think that he, um, Thomas Jefferson dealt with this issue as well, and at one point he used the analogy of having a wolf by the ear. Uh, slavery is like having a wolf by the ear. You can't hang on and you can't let go. Uh, either way, you're in a bad situation. And I suspect Marshall felt much the same. Uh, one thing Thomas Jefferson hoped was that by expanding the size of the United States, it would result in diffusion, as he called it, of those who were enslaved, and ultimately slavery would become less important in American society. Um, I think that Marshall instead hoped uh, that large numbers of people, of people of African descent, uh, could be returned to Africa in the colony of Liberia, reducing the numbers in the United States and ameliorating the problem. Uh, that's my, my read on him. But Marshall does not uh, address this directly. Uh, the closest to it, I found nothing in his letters uh, or other materials that have been collected from him that deal with uh, that, this particular element. Um, I think instead you have to look at his cases, and in particular at the antelope. And there you find uh, that Marshall uh, is trying to uh, look within the Constitution for a textual basis uh, of how to deal with slavery that at the same time is not going to result in another Missouri controversy, another, another conflict over slavery. And I think he very conveniently finds that in property. Uh, if you, you, you can argue all day about whether the Constitution is a pro-slavery document, but there's no question it's a pro-property document. So looking at it as a controlling text, I think Marshall is going to focus on uh, property is the key here and that by talking about slavery in terms of property, uh, we can uh, uh, control the conflict over this institution. Marshall is trying to find in the text of the Constitution uh, support for these decisions that he's making. Uh, one of his brilliant uh, conceptions was to look at the Constitution as a statutory document in many ways, as, as written law. Uh, rather than a collection of ideals and hopes and dreams. Uh, and that being the case, he wants to find in there uh, something that allows him to support the institution of slavery uh, in a, a way that uh, reduces the conflict over this institution. Um, now, you look at the Constitution and you can argue all day about whether it is a pro-slavery document, but the Constitution is clearly a pro-property document. So Marshall, by using property, is able to say clearly the Constitution supports slavery because enslaved people are property. Now this has long-term implications that I'm sure John Marshall did not envision. Uh, it allows uh, slave owners to say, if this is property, we should be allowed to take our property anywhere. 
So something like the, 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 the splitting up of slave and free that occurs in the Missouri controversy will ultimately, under that reasoning, be found unconstitutional in the Dred Scott case. Uh, but Marshall is looking for that textual linchpin uh, to work out this problem of slavery, and he finds it in property.